student introduction. And I happen to be a longtime friend of India. I admire its civilization and its history and its great people. I have many personal friends who are from India and who have influenced my thoughts and, and direction. For example, uh, my dean at the, at the Northwestern University Kellogg School of Management was Deepak Jain. Deepak was a beloved, is, and is a beloved uh, mover and shaker. And Deepak um, has helped so many other universities throughout the world with his wisdom. I work very often with Jagdish Sheff who has opened up so many new ideas in his 30 or so books and uh, everything being exciting about what he does. I recently met V. Kumar. V. Kumar wrote a book that I think is the best guide to digital marketing. And it is called The, um, uh, the Intelligent marketer or something like that, B. Kumar. So I find that although I'm supposed to share my knowledge, I'm as interested in continuous learning. We call that lifetime learning. Uh, when anyone stops learning, they stop living. So it's really a decision about what kind of life you want to lead. Now, I want to go to my talk because there's so much to say about how marketing operates and how in how influential it is in the affairs of human beings now i'm going to start by clicking on my slides let me see if we can do that and let me open yes, this up better yes, yes. Okay, but I, I want to do it this way. Okay. Uh, this is just a uh, opening to show, by the way, that picture of me was probably taken in Russia because I see a little writing like that on the upper left. But this, uh, these two books have been very important. They were both written in the last few years. And I'm going to say, what is marketing 5.0? Was there a 4.0, 3.0? What does that mean? Well, I, I will explain that. And the latest book is H2H marketing. But what does H mean? We call it human to human marketing. That's what it's about. Don't say it's about a producer and a consumer uh, and a wholesaler and a retailer. It's about people. It's about people working with other people for the mutual advantage, I would hope. So let me move on. I was asked to talk about where was marketing in the past? Where is it today? Where will it be in the future? And that means I, a little history is important. So the concept of, mar of marketing is a new one, by the way, because the concept of markets is really the starting point. Markets have, has been a concept in, in human civilization. Uh, when you start seeing that we move from the, the stage of, of being hunters and we move to the stage of being growers and, and agricultural people uh, and and when we began to grow crops uh, and exceeded the number we needed to consume personally, we went and displayed our crops by just sitting on the road with some things that are in surplus and offering it to buyers if they would give, me, give us something back for, for that. And in fact, the original markets were bartered markets to a large extent. Uh, of exchanging something for something else. So the concept of exchange is key to marketing uh, because it's a peaceful kind of idea. It's not grabbing someone else's property and making it your own, uh, holding up a gun to someone to get something. 
it's peaceful. It's voluntary. People agree that they're both better off by the exchange. Now, when did marketing appear? It began in some, as a word used in the title of some textbooks back in the beginning of the uh, 20th century, 1905, 1910. And actually, these textbooks were written not by anyone called a marketer. There was not a subject being taught called marketing, but these were economists who were unhappy with the state of economic theory. They wondered why don't economists talk about salespeople? Aren't they part of the economy? What about advertising, promotion? Is it only about price? The economists only talk about price, price, price. So they started to write books and these books had new material for e economics. Unfortunately, even today, many economists do not recognize marketing as an economic subject, as an intrinsic core economic subject. Uh, but in any case, the uh, the books came out, and now I'm going to move on to the way people who were marketers, scholars, studied the subject of marketing. Some of them were mostly interested in looking at a commodity. I mean, the wheat. What's the history of wheat? What's the history of coffee? Uh, what stages did that commodity go through? Some others felt, no, they wanted to study the functions involved in marketing, like when, wh who are the buyers? Who are the sellers? What is selling like? What is storing like when you store something to, buy, to sell later? Uh, advertising. Another group thought, no, let's look at the, at the institutions, the middlemen, the importers, the exports, uh, exporters, the insurance companies, and so on. And some marketers wanted to just think of the whole system and the linkages between sales, production, finance. And then uh, finally a group, and I was one of those who I felt that marketing is part of management, part of managing uh, uh, the sale of whatever you make and doing it intelligently and efficiently. So this is merely to show you that many people who are scholars in marketing have different approaches to their, their interest. In fact, marketing has gone through a lot of stages. It all began with a sort of a, a being centered on a product. It could be uh, something that uh, people uh, eat or drink, but the product was important. Later on, as, as we got more industrial, it was, what about a car? We are a car company. Uh, we are a uh, we are a health company. The product and the product was all important. You wanted to make a good product and um, make it better than your competitors and their products. Now uh, later on, we began to have so much competition that the winners were those companies that were more concerned with the buyer, the customer. They said it's important to have a good product, but we have to design it for a target market, a group that really will be um, fascinated with what our offer is, and we will win the uh, contest. Uh, so customer orientation came about, and now there's many uh, systems for measuring how customer oriented is your company. In Australia, we have um, a good scholar named Chris Brown, who has a, a whole book about how to improve your customer orientation, how to know exactly how good it really is. But that was passed, never dropped, but it moved on to branding. The concept of a brand, which was uh, for probably first appeared when, when you saw paintings and someone painted something and put his, his, his or her name on the painting. That was branding. It was Picasso. Picasso. It was earlier than that. Uh, so many famous names. Uh, 
Michelangelo, Da Vinci, but people became brands too, but product and products became brands. And I recently wrote a book called uh, Brand Activism, which I will get to. It's, a, it's a, a new idea for what a brand really is supposed to do and be. And then a revolution occurred in marketing, and that is the digital revolution. And it has changed so many of the traditions and older practices of marketing. And no company can manage to survive if it doesn't go digital in part or in whole. I will say more about that. And no company is going to survive if it doesn't care about the common good, if it doesn't care about hunger and uh, problems of uh, unequal income and wealth. Uh, so societal values, societal problems have to be factored into the work of marketers too. So where is your company now? I hope you've moved through these stages and I'll say more about it. I go back to Peter Drucker in a lot of my thinking. To me, he was the ultimate humanist. Humanism is a philosophy that doesn't draw on particular religions or, uh, or traditions or myths or anything like that. It just talks about people uh, finding a way, a style of life where they can be uh, adapted very well to nature and to the uh, opportunities that that uh, that are presented to them. Uh, Drucker uh, said many things uh, that we want to remember. Uh, he said that the corporation, the modern corporation, is in trouble because it is seen increasingly by more and more people as deeply at odds with basic needs and basic values of society and community. And some of you know that I moved um, not away from marketing, but from marketing to an interest in two systems, the systems we all live under, or most many people do in this world, the system of capitalism and the system of democracy. So I needed to understand those better because I didn't think they were performing as well as they should perform. And that's what Drucker was saying, where they're there's a, a question of the odds between the basic needs and values that people have and want and the way it's actually being performed. Is capitalism a gift to people, making their lives better? Yes, certain people have brilliant lives, lots of money, lots of goods, but the question is how many? And isn't it shameful if anyone goes hungry in the, in the world at any point in time. So, so Drucker spent his life looking at how he as the father of modern management, and he didn't name that himself, but he was seen as the father of modern management, wanted to make companies, those who sell things, much more generous and and, and smart about the needs that they want, are meeting and, and how to do a good job of, of doing that. And then he pointed out two functions of the several functions taught in business schools, but two of them that are the most important. And he called them marketing and innovation. Those two produce the results. All the rest are costs. By the way, that angered a lot of people. Uh, the finance people felt, hey, he's saying we're not that important. Uh, and, and the production people were not happy. Well, they're all important. But if you don't do your innovation, your firm dies. And if you don't know how to market your innovations, the firm dies. And that was what he said. And he said the purpose of a company is not to make profits. He didn't deny that. He simply said, but the real purpose is to create customers. Without customers, you have no profits. And he reminded us, therefore, of the customer orientation. The aim of marketing is to know and understand the customer so well that the product or service 
fits and sells itself. Do you know that all this clamor to get a product sold um, would be not necessary if you created something that people immediately see and want and line up to buy. The aim of, of, of great marketing is to create something that was not there. And when the people find out about it, they just, they want, all you need are not salesmen, you need only order takers because the people are there to buy. They want that new car or whatever else gets their attention. That's, that's the high aim of marketing. Peter said the best way to predict the future is to create it. So don't say that it's made for you and you should be a fatalist and just adapt to it. You can help make the future what it should be. And if the gods wanted to destroy you, they would give you 20 years of success. Uh, very interesting because a lot of the real problem of a failing organization is that it, it went on too long with what made it great and didn't notice that the world changed in the meantime. And so success is a blinder uh, if you only depend on success. I all urge you all to go back to reading any of Drucker's writings because they are fresh forever. So I mentioned a, a recent book called Marketing 5.0. Actually, that means that marketing has gone through stages, as I pointed out, other stages. But there was never a book written by me or anyone called 1.0, 2.0. However, we did write Marketing 3.0. And the reason we made it, wrote it, we said that a company can practice marketing just as a function. You know, I make a product and I'm going to find a way to sell it. Very functional. That would be 1.0. There's no dressing, there's no pizzazz, there's uh, nothing very emotional or enticing about it. You just make your product and you go out and sell it. That's 1.0 if it existed. And there are many companies still thinking that way. All we have to do is make a product and, and tell people about it. Uh, and then we got to realize that emotions really guide and really run decision making. In fact, we're not really totally rational human beings. We wish we would be, some of us, but we know that that would be limited. The fact is that we make a decision, maybe 90% of it was emotionally influenced and driven. Let's say the decision had some risks. Of course, your attitude toward risk affects what your, your, your judgment. So the recognition that when you're going to, sell something, it should trigger emotions too. And you should be aware of what they are in the buyer and, um, and adapt. And then this book 3.0 went to a, another level and said, but really isn't the whole thing about creating, uh, meeting needs, creating offers that really make the lives of people better. That 3.0 is the the well-being of people sent as the center of why we are engaged in our marketing activity. So all in one book, we did 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. We did write 4.0 because that was the time that the revolution, the digital revolution began to impact on all of our thinking. And the question was, do we give up all of our traditional approaches to advertising and uh, promotion, or do we use some of it? But we must, of course, start selling online too. On the whole online world is before us. And so it could have, and 4.0 wraps up all of the impact of the digital revolution. Why did we write 5.0? because we recognize that the digital has led to many other new technologies that I will go over with you shortly, and that they have to be in one place where you could see that so many new things are tools for the marketing group to work with. So let's move on. You know, the whole field of marketing has some major tenets, and I'm just 
reminding you that we are a we look and center on buyer needs, not on product being product centered. We use uh, a set of tools which we sometimes call the four P's uh, that any marketing plan should at least address product, what's it like, price, place where will the product be found, and um, promotion. Now, all of those get more elaborated, like when we say product, of course, it includes service and packaging. We don't need another P for packaging because product products may be put in a package and uh, so on. And, and, and products are accompanied by services. So that's why they were not explicit. Uh, and promotion, there were different forms of promotion that could be spelled out and so on. Anyways, we did get into a, con a mindset called the STP mindset, that uh, a market consists of many people. They are different types of people. We can create and recognize segments. We can't serve everyone. Any company is limited in its resources and its objectives. So we choose a segment, we understand it well, and we target the people in that segment with our offers. And then we have a statement about who we are and what, why, why they should buy from us. What's our, we position ourselves against our competition. And all of that is done with a marketing process that I'd like to summarize as shown. It all starts with what? This is so important. People forget it. If you're going to start a business, the first thing you must do is MR, marketing research. You've got to see if there's any reason to really go after that market. Who are the buyers? What do they want? Can they get it from someone else? So marketing research is the foundation, the beginning. And there are many techniques there. But uh, it must lead to STP that we've chosen a segment, a target, and position. And then we uh, go ahead and do our uh, total marketing plan uh, 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 for the target market. We have, as part of that, a VP, a value proposition, which is a simple statement of, why, of what we offer to, to you as a buyer. And we, we are very careful in crafting our value proposition. And, uh, oh, and then we get to the marketing plan with all the details. And then we implement, I, we implement the marketing plan. And uh, hopefully uh, we, we did well. So we have to have controls. We have to uh, have key metrics that we measure uh, to see if we're achieving our objectives. And by the way, everything goes backwards too. Namely, if we're, if we launched a product and it's not doing well, we better go backwards. Was it a problem of the wrong metrics? Or was it a problem of poor implementation? No, it wasn't that. Well, maybe it was a poor marketing plan. It, it missed some things in the plan. Maybe the value proposition wasn't very clear and confusing. Uh, maybe we chose the wrong target market, uh, the wrong segment. We had very poor marketing research. Do you understand how it's very iterative, this whole system? Well, let's move on. Uh, let's talk about real marketing uh, and three different views. Uh, one view might be, sure, I'm a company and I practice marketing because look at me, I have a sales force. I do advertising, pricing and promotion. Now a newer, viewer of, a new, newer view of marketing is uh, I, as a company, say, you know, my job really is to be able to create, communicate, and deliver superior value. That's the key word, value, superior value, not value as I see it, but the value as the consumer will see it, to a target market at a profit, if you want to add that, or at some other goal, the well-being of the customers or whatever else. A nonprofit is not going to be saying I'm doing this for profit, but I'm doing this to make a better world. So that view is the one I normally put forward to create, communicate, and deliver superior value. CCDV would be the idea. And the latest view is that marketing is the business discipline 
driving profitable and responsible company growth. I mean, from a company point of view, it should be the business discipline to drive profitable and responsible company growth. <clears throat> so I want to put in one on one slide many of the new newer ways we're looking at uh, today's field of marketing. <clears throat> I hope if you work for a company or if you're a student planning to go into marketing, you pay attention to the concept of the customer journey. And you can visualize it this way. Let's say uh, you're part of a company that makes automobiles and you have dealers who uh, will sell the cars. And a dealer sits in his uh, dealership uh, waiting for customers. And one walks in. Somehow that is a potential buyer who came to this dealer. How did he get there? Well, that's a whole story. It would be important to know that. Actually, if the person actually sees the car, ends up buying it from you, please find out how did it all start? Because that's the key. What were the touch points on the journey? Was it, when did he... When did he or she decide they needed the car? <clears throat> was it a, did their car break down? <clears throat> did they come into some money? What did they do? Did they end up going to every dealership? No, they didn't. <clears throat> what ads did they see? Which ones moved them? Who do they speak to among their friends about cars? <clears throat> so what was the customer journey? So put together a lot of information on customer journey and touch points. And the main point there is make it easy for potential customers to find it very easy to get, become aware of you, interested in, in your company and uh, ready to go in and see the product. <clears throat> now let's move to personas marketing. And we tell our, 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 our students, we had sometimes create fictional people to understand better the target customer. Uh, it's one thing to say, well, the target customer wants a, a skincare product. Well, what, but is it a woman or a man? How old is she if it's a woman? Well, she's 35 to 50. Oh, you mean they use skincare products? Okay, can we can we call her Lucy? All right, Lucy, and uh, well, say some more things about Lucy. Why are we doing this? Because we want the copywriters and the advertising people to have a concrete picture of a person that they understand so well that they can know what to com how to communicate. What are the words? and messages that would really connect well with this kind of person. So we do a lot of work with, uh, uh, with uh, developing uh, archetypal people and so on. Uh, content marketing is the idea that we're always feeding content to the market we are serving. And we ought to not make all the content high selling content. You know, some people, some companies say everything, you, every time you make a communication, splash our name there and sell, sell, sell. Be, you know, you shout about your product. Well, there's a whole set of other things that could engage the customer's interest. Listen, what if your customer loves uh, cricket as a game? Uh, and it has nothing to do with the fact I'm a, I'm a car dealer. But I know he... he loves cricket. I just saw a beautiful article about a cricket player play that took place. I'm going to send it to him. Well, you're thinking of him. That's good. He he, he probably will write you back. Hey, hey I was a good, I, I had missed that article. Was, but thanks for thinking uh, of sending it to me. You can warm up a relationship and connect with more people because you're interested in what they're interested in. And, and content that you develop is of interest to them. Now, a new thing that's happening in marketing is influencer, influencer marketing. And the idea there is in the online world now, some people have great followings. 
Well, it all started with Facebook in a sense, because on Facebook, uh, you, you actually went and displayed yourself and you also wanted to meet other people. And you take some of our famous singers uh, uh, or athletes and so on, they, 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 they have so many people watching what they're doing, what they're drinking, eating. So some of those influencers uh, are being, uh, let, let, let's say uh, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan is uh, respected around the world. He won, uh, surprisingly, a Nobel Prize for literature. And uh, so many people follow him. And if we see that Bob Dylan is drinking Pepsi-Cola, not Coca-Cola, just, uh, just when we see a, vi a video of him, that was very helpful to Pepsi-Cola. Now, did Dylan say that he's going to, if, if they pay him some money, he will be shown drinking Pepsi-Cola? No, we don't know about that. <clears throat> but a lot of... Uh, high visibles we call these people with high uh, fame and, uh, and and followers <clears throat> fans huge fans are beginning to um, want money from those uh, uh, marketers who uh, whose products they will display and 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 some companies are regretfully paying for influence of that kind we can have a whole debate about that. Omnichannel marketing, pay attention to it. There, there's so many, whoever thought that you would go to a gas station to buy your food? Well, gas stations have evolved from just selling gas to being places of, on the quick, you can get your, 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 your food needs met. So what are some of the possible channels for uh, growing and developing our, 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 the availability of our product. Um, lean marketing, a uh, very interesting idea about if you're an entrepreneur, and we hope everyone is in some ways, to some extent, uh, that you um, uh, start by making a, a, a simple um, picture of what you're trying to sell, and you show that picture to some people. It's maybe a cartoon, it's a little drawing, and they might say, I'm not interested in that, or some will say, I'm very interested, but I think it, would, it ought to be better. You, you sort of iterate. You don't, you don't take three years to make a perfect product. You do it iteratively. You start it, you get feedback, you improve it. So you should read about lean marketing, and Eric Ries has written about that. And social cause marketing is that we could even use the four P's to get to help people stop smoking if they want to stop smoking, to uh, avoid drugs if possible, uh, to to do a better job with COVID. I mean, COVID re today requires uh, not being exposed to the disease by wearing a mask and keeping social distance and being vaccinated. And who would ever expect people to appear who don't want to be vaccinated and saved from getting killed by COVID. Well, that's one of the biggest issues now in social cause marketing. How do we get more people to wear a mask and, and to um, accept vaccination? Whoever thought that would be a problem and uh, so on and so forth. Now, design and service dominant logic is coming into um, visibility, design thinking, design thinking in, in this book, H2H Marketing, we do a lot of talking about the, that marketing must rely on design thinking in all of its uh, manifestations. And we also talk about service, that most products are really not products, they are the systems for delivering a service, a service. I mean, uh, when someone, uh, take this one example, um, it was, it was a Harvard professor talked about uh, milkshakes. He says, how come uh, if someone is going to drive a long distance uh, to, to get to his job and he has a car, uh, he could, before he starts out, he could make a stop at a place and have a, buy a coffee and, or he can buy some uh, candy bar 
or he can buy a milkshake. Um, what's he likely to do? And and the point he made with that example is, well, if it's if it's a if it's a bar that that bar this this is a, a one and a half hour drive. Uh, he'll be finished with the candy bar in no time, and that's not going to entertain or occupy his attention, unfortunately. Uh, coffee will be gone in about 10 minutes, uh, but a good milkshake, a thick milkshake, for an hour or so, he'll be busy drinking that and, 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 and driving. So the idea being, uh, it isn't the product, it's what, what is the purpose of the service or, or the product, what is the service delivered by the product? And for the driver, it's a, an hour of enjoying some a good drink called a milkshake. Okay, now I said I'm gonna talk about uh, some of these new technologies that uh, really are covered in our 5.0 book. Um, I'm gonna be very brief. Uh, it's, I should call this 3D printing, but there is a 5D printing as well. We're all going to be working with those machines to develop uh, parts. Uh, we'll actually be building homes using 3D uh, or 5D printing. 5D came up because a lot of times when you create a, a component using 3D, it's too weak to um, last under the pressure where it's going to be put into a bigger unit that has a lot of pressure on it. So you need uh, a, a more sophisticated form of printing something as a component. AI, we could talk forever about AI, but the focus on the idea of algorithms. Algorithms will run our lives. I hope they're good ones. They're not biased and so on. What it means is this, if, if every college uh, will move toward having an algorithm to be used to decide which students to accept. Namely, in the old days, <clears throat> the students were accepted uh, based on a meeting with each one who wanted to come to the college. And uh, then in the mind of this very experienced uh, administrator, he or she might say, oh, that, that's, that student seems good to me. We should, uh, should uh, accept them. But you know, uh, what makes a really good student may, may, is, is something you can study by looking back at your previous students and, and figuring out and doing what we call a, uh, um, a machine learning. From all the past data, you can find out what were the variables that were tied to the best students that you had accepted in the past. And you build an algorithm which you use, you put in, here's a new student that is applying to your school, uh, you put in uh, the data of that student into the algorithm and it gives you the following. Yes, accept the student. No, do not accept that applicant. Maybe you need even more information before we, we, the algorithm, can decide. In other words, you're entrusting the decision now to a more scientific way to judge good versus bad applicants. Now, the same thing goes on in banks. Uh, should I make a loan? Now, there are some good bankers who have so much experience in knowing whether to make that loan, but more banks are depending now on algorithms to make the decision uh, based on factors that uh, were correlated to very good loans in the past. And digital and social media, you know all of that, all of you are using that. Uh, voice uh, recognition is uh, increasingly important, using the voice in the marketing. What, after all, is Siri like or Alexa, where you, these uh, fictional people can answer any question we might have. And uh, so I could be in the supermarket and I see a new product and I might see there's an opportunity to do a chat. It's called a chat bot. And I can say, uh, tell me, how much uh, uh, do you cost? What, what you, what, uh, can I get delivery uh, to, uh, uh, to far, a far away destination? You can put questions in the chat bot and the voice will be, uh, your voice will be answered by that voice. Facial recognition is getting much more interesting now to uh, people and they think that 
the face re reveals a lot uh, of emotion and so on, and um, uh, work is going on there. Well, the idea there was normally you can tell what a person's state of mind is by their face, uh, whether they are in a happy state or depressed state and so on and so forth. But a, mo a lot of it has to do with gathering big data and machine learning and robotics. We have to welcome robots in our lives. Uh, assume that they will be partners, uh, that uh, a uh, human and a robot together, working together, can do more than a human alone, but that the robot won't take over uh, and have a consciousness of its own. Uh, that's for science fiction to speculate on. And I mentioned chat chatbots. And I love the uh, use of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, where you actually can create a new product and show it to people as if it really exists. You could even make the factory exist and show how it's being produced if you want. Uh, but it's not there. It's, you've never put a dime into actually building a factory or making the product, but it looks like it exists. And then you can get consumers to tell you if they would buy that product, do they have interest and so on. Blockchains and digital money is a whole new development. Uh, and I won't comment further, but pay attention to that. Pay attention to uh, the whole sensory world, the use of uh, chips to uh, actually, you know, you, you, let's say whenever I, let's say I, I work every day and take the same elevator to the third floor. Why doesn't the elevator know who I am? Why do I have to press a button? I just walked in and it should know enough about me to move to the third floor. Or we, we may think of that as the door to our home. As I walk toward the door, it, it just opens for me or my car door opens. The world of, you know, that we call that the, uh, the whole world gets intelligent. Marketing automation is a goal where, here's the problem. Marketing developments go on day and night, but everyone has to sleep eight hours or more a, a, a night. Uh, so do you mean to say we can shut off our marketing activities because we have to go to sleep uh, in the evening? No, can't we? put together uh, intelligent programs that if they spot that the competitor where well, we were asleep, lowered his price by X, the intelligent program knows that it should lower our price by Y in, in retaliation. So can we automate a lot of operations that are responses to things that might happen in the marketplace when either we're awake or asleep. <clears throat> uh, what about drones? Can they help in our marketing effort? Well, I thought they, I thought I heard Amazon uh, is playing around with the idea of delivery by drones. So in other words, I, uh, Amazon has always thought that it wants zero time for delivery. Was it, to get close to zero time, the moment the order comes in, a drone goes to the and drops the product off on the door steps of the uh, of person ordering it. Um, <clears throat> so all these things, biometrics and neuroscience are very important. And um, uh, I have, we have on our faculty at Northwestern a, a terrific neuroscientist who you know, can work for, with companies too, to help um, uh, understand whether some message we might send out to our potential consumers would would just be flat and, and not do anything to the receiver of the message or would have a real buzz. The neuroscientist with, uh, samples the messages uh, by having some volunteers put on their head uh, brain uh, measurement tools, scan, brain scanners, and we can then trace the brain waves to see if there's been any blip and anything about the message, any word in the message, any point made by the message that caused some blip to happen, which means some excitement, whether it was 
positive or negative, we can find out afterwards by asking the person what they might remember about why something moved them. But I think neuroscience uh, has a, another level of understanding our customers. Now, um, I'm going to take a few minutes to uh, uh, say a few things now. The book, Firms of Endearment, I would like you to look at that book because the um, group, actually, uh, you may know Sisodia, Raj, and Jagdisheth uh, are the authors and uh, two wonderful, uh, br brilliant uh, marketing scientists. They said, let's find out what companies in America people are the happiest with that make those companies make people happy. In fact, people would be sad if Coca-Cola disappeared. If, uh, uh, if, um, if any company of uh, those disappeared. So they studied these 25 companies that people really find dear and found that all 25 were very profitable. In fact, they, there was a nine to one ratio over competitors of these companies uh, in the performance of these happy, happy creation, creating companies. Uh, and the characteristics of these companies, people, the employees were more motivated and happy, more uh, customers were more loyal. Uh, there was more innovation going on and they all paid attention to the environment. So what was important is the following. What were the characteristics of these su greatly successful companies? Now, I, the reason I love this list is because I want, if you work at a company now, see how well it measures to these eight traits. I hope all of them are present in the company you're working for. In other words, your company should not only be about the shareholders, the ones who gave some money to the company, but the stakeholders, the employees, the communities, the suppliers who work with you, the distributors, the wholesalers. <clears throat> in other words, you're supposed to be satisfying not, not making profits for one person called a, uh, a shareholder, but benefits your company exists to create a better life for all the stakeholders. And the salaries paid to the top people should be relatively modest, not 300 times what the average worker uh, makes, which is the a number in the United States. You know, when Peter Drucker wrote his first book, he said 20 times the owner of the company should be modest, get 20 times as much as the average worker in the company. Well, it's gone up, up, up too much. Uh, I'm not saying it should be 20, maybe it should be 100, but not 300. They operate, these companies operate an open door policy. Anyone can see the boss. It's interesting. Interesting that anyone can see the boss if they have something important to say. The compensation uh, is uh, very good, uh, more than paid by the competitors. The employee training is longer and the employees stay longer with the company. Uh, and the company seeks people who are passionate about customers and satisfying customers. And good suppliers, true partners who want to improve the profits, not only their own profits, but the profits of the companies that they are supplying. And they believe that corporate culture is key and the greatest asset to build a good, strong corporate culture. And the surprising thing is that these companies don't spend that much in marketing. Why? Because their customers do the marketing. They so satisfy their customers that their customers are talking about the car they just bought, how great it is, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and remember, any recommendation that comes from a, a customer is worth more than any ad that came from an advertising company. And so I mentioned that we've been busy thinking about the responsibilities of companies. And um, my first book studied 45 companies that all had 
done a good job of corporate social responsibility. But the latest book, Brand Activism, has to do with um, your brand should reveal your values as a company. In other words, yes, you're gonna, your brand is going to tell me what you make and, and its price and so on. But what, what are you really like as a company? Am I comfortable buying from a company like, you, like yours? Do you care? Are you, are you environmental in any way? If you're not environmental, you're, that's, that's bad because we're facing a world of, of floods and fires and, and deserts and so on. <clears throat> and we have to be environmental. Do you care about hunger and people who are poor? So brand, the brand has to demonstrate more about your purpose and your existence as a company. Now, this may be a good summary uh, at this point because um, you're either an old type company or a new type company. Uh, when you're an old type company, your purpose is profits. Your environmental concern is kind of moderate. You probably talk about it more than doing much about it. And you don't have any social concerns. And in my country, you're probably a, a Republican kind of uh, philosophy, political philosophy, which is minimal government. Um, people must make their own decisions. They don't, they shouldn't be taken care of in any way and so on. A new company, the purpose, well-being for of all, well-being of the stakeholders and, and, and of all really. Uh, environment concerns, everything is thought through, everything that the company buys, the packaging, what it does with the packaging, what it does with the product when the product is over, it, it is totally environmental. And the socially, the company is one that has a lot of concern about uh, uh, helping people. So that puts that together. Now, we're, I won't go into this, but I will just say that Paul Pullman, who ran the Unilever company, to me was the ideal CEO. He even did this. He said, I have not only one stakeholder, the consumers, but I have seven stakeholders. And one of my stakeholders is the planet. And by the way, the seventh and least important stakeholder is the shareholder who, who supplied some money. He's not dismissing them. He's just saying that he's uh, stakeholder oriented. And he said that in, in developing his plan for the company, that he was going to double his profits, cut in half the environmental impact, and triple its social impact. And his company grew from 38 billion to 60 billion during his 10 years of management. And the whole idea was thought through about being more than just a old fashioned company that makes money. I won't say more about that. There's a fellow uh, uh, who runs a company called Best Buy who uh, has done a marvelous job with that company. It uh, sells electronics, but he says, define your business around purpose and humanity. Yes, yes, make sure you do that. Stakeholder capitalism, not shareholder capitalism. Um, and make a difference to the people you're working with around you and, and who you work with uh, through your connections to other people and hope that they make a difference to other people in the world and so on. So I'll skip that. And let's, let me end my talk by talking about marketing in the future to remind you of some things. Consumers will be able to select in the future the best brands without resorting to the brands advertising and salespeople. That is more of the it, it, the consumers have so much information at their fingertips about anything they want to buy that, that they will learn what you really like as a supplier 
without all your advertising and all your, your, your boasting. Marketing success will depend mostly on smart pricing and owning strong channel positions in the future. Marketing creativity will be crucial in, in carrying on experiential marketing. That is engagement with your customers will require, you know, even getting a, a woman to go to your dress shop uh, when she could actually see whatever you make on online. Why, my wife in my own uh, family, she doesn't, rarely goes to stores. Uh, COVID of course has been a problem, but rarely stores, she buys everything online. So if you're running a store, how do you get people in, to come to your store when they can see what you've got without going to your store? That's the need for creativity. Uh, marketers will make more use of customer journey mapping, touch point marketing, personas, content, and influencers. Marketers will increase their use of virtual reality to deliver better product understanding to their prospects. And marketers will make greater use of neural networking. You remember I mentioned the, uh, uh, the specialists who know how the brain work, works. So the brain is being increasingly being studied, of course, by marketers and, and, and by scientists to identify the best stimuli. And marketers will use predictive analytics and machine learning to identify and be more successful converting to the best prospects. I usually end with this kind of statement. Within the next five years, uh, you, uh, you, you, you better <laughs> pay attention to a lot of these things or you're going to be out of business. I'm being blocked a little by my own screen. But if you want to be a success in business, be a lifetime learner and watch the world and see where it's going. And don't move too fast ahead of it, but certainly don't move too slow and ignore it. Thank you very much. These are my ideas on the field of marketing. And I hope uh, you've taken notes if you've had interest in some of these things and you do some follow-up yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for such an engaging discussion and enriching us with your wonderful thoughts and innovative ideas of marketing. With your kind permission, can we take some questions from our participants, sir? Yes, by all means. Sure, sir. We have lots of questions, but looking at the positive time, few only I'll take. Uh, I have a question from Dr. P. Perisami. How U.S. marketing management will match the other country's marketing management? As an author, how would you differentiate in this pandemic era? Your insights, please. Yes, well, it sounds like there's a couple of uh, issues in that question. <clears throat> um, the, the COVID problem, too, uh, is, is a very big one. And uh, you almost learn something about countries by seeing how well they've coped. I was even interested in possibly giving a Kotler Prize to the woman who is the prime minister of New Zealand, uh, just simply based on the intelligent way she handled the COVID pro uh, problem and, and kept people safe. And the awful way the U.S., under Trump particularly, neglected the problem. It, we had an idiot for a leader, uh, an egotistical idiot. Uh, but each country, uh, if, if, if behind that question is the question of what, which countries are the smartest about marketing and so on, uh, and... I would say that um, marketing uh, has, the question really is, is the way I have presented marketing the only way to think of marketing? Uh, I keep waiting for someone to come along who says, you know, what Kotler said was valuable and useful at the time, but there's a whole different approach. 
and Kotler is obsolete now. I would welcome that. I would welcome the idea that someone is, is much smarter about creating well-being in the world than our system seems to be. I'll take another question, please. Sure, sir. Another question is from uh, Dr. Sarvana Kumar. Can you give us some tips of tourism and hospitality marketing in the post-COVID pandemic scenario? Wow, yes. Because the among the industries hurt by the uh, COVID it, uh, have been uh, industries that bring people to, uh, together. Uh, look at the look at the movie houses where we always sat and and that and that was a relief from our work day life. We could watch a good movie with others. Uh, look at the hotels uh, that people um, stopped going to. Uh, but one second, one second. I'm here. <laughs> uh, so, okay, uh, sorry about that. So uh, the hospitality industry, you know, this we're doing a new edition of our book on hospitality marketing. It's really hospitality and tourism. So we know COVID really cut down tourism completely, right? Uh, and and uh, like I couldn't go to Canada, our neighbor, because I would bring, not me, but uh, we could bring COVID, to the Canadians. Now, just recently, they the door opened a bit. A bit. But uh, hotels are, uh, we're actually being used for people, for homeless people or, or other purposes, just to have something to do. And now with post-COVID, the hotels uh, have to get back, and in getting back, uh, did they have good hospitality practices at the beginning? I mean, those that never had those good hospitality practices are going to be very slow at getting back and satisfying anyone. Uh, this is an opportunity to revise your whole view of, of the hotel. Uh, and 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 what what makes a, 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 a fine experience in a hotel setting? Uh, any other question? Thank you, sir. One more question I'll take because we have a little more for you from our faculty members. Uh, okay. This is the one last question I'll take, and then I'll move for next segment. Do you think pharmaceutical marketing should become more patient centric rather than product centric, and does that uh, necessitate direct to consumer promotion? of prescription uh, of medicines? Yeah, um, there's a lot of criticism of pharmaceutical marketers, uh, deservedly too. In fact, we've had some very bad episodes of uh, some pharmaceuticals getting people hooked on something and continuously needing that, that you know, addictive uh, problems of, and so on. Uh, produced a big crisis in the United States. But, uh, you know, um, trust is essential in pharmaceutical marketing. Uh, you, 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 when it came to even uh, having an injection of the vaccine, uh, we had uh, offers from three different firms. Uh, which one do we trust if we had a choice of what, which vaccine to use? How do we know that profits are the minor part of the, that pharmaceutical company's interests. It's, it's doing wonders for the world and, and, and improving health. So pharmaceutical marketers, I, I work a lot with Merck uh, and Pfizer. They're very fine firms. I, I know some of your Indian firms as well. Uh, you know, we end up taking pills. Where were the pills made? Well, India is a very big producer of pills for people around the world. We hope that in the, uh, Indian pharmaceutical firms are doing their best to control for uh, care and, 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 and service. Uh, and actually, India has been fantastic in, its, uh, uh, in the, what it has done for, in many kinds of surgeries. Too. I mean, the whole healthcare industry in, in India has developed some interesting ways to help people who got blind from 
blind sickness or, or this or that. Well, I don't want to go off the tangent except to say that India has a very big role to play in the world health scene. And, but it must be accompanied by, by trust and, 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 and a good, dependable um, uh, um, understanding actually us as consumers and what we care about when we are about to take a pill or, or, or face a medical situation. Well, those are all wonderful questions. I, I, the, the questions were better than my answers, but they are something for me to think about. So thank you, sir. I'm very impressed with your people at the university. And thank you, sir, for clarifying our participants' queries and quenching our thirst for knowledge with your intellectual views.